So thank you for the introduction. And I would also like to thank the organizers uh, for inviting me to this really great uh, workshop. So today I will speak about philosophical interpretations of metamathematical results, in particular of Gödel's second theorem and of Tarski's theorem. And more specifically, I will be concerned with the question how we can infer prevalent philosophical interpretations from the underlying metamathematical theorems. And the plan of the talk is as follows. So we'll start with the standard roots of inferring informal versions of Gödel and Tarski's theorems from the underlying metamathematical results. And I will argue that the standard inference is not satisfactory since the underlying metamathematical theorems rely on specific but arbitrarily chosen Gödel numberings and notation systems. And so in order to fix this, stronger metamathematical results are called for, which establish the invariance regarding um, numberings and notation systems of Gödel and Tarski's theorems. And in the second part of the talk, I will introduce deviant formalization choices, which give rise to provable consistency sentences and definable truth predicates. And even though I will argue, of course, that these uh, counterexamples to Gödel and Tarski's theorems are not genuine refutations, they show that, we, that more care is needed when we want to formalize and prove invariance claims. And then in the third part, I will show how we can abstract away from the choice of the numbering. And in the fourth part, I will introduce versions of Gödel and Tarski's theorem, which are invariant regarding Gödel numberings and notation systems. OK, so let's start with the following philosophical um, interpretation of Gödel's second theorem, which is due to Shapiro, according to which no consistent theory that contains a certain amount of arithmetic can prove its own consistency. And even though this claim is not some esoteric philosophical thesis, it certainly differs from precisely formulated metamathematical results, such as the following famous version of Gödel's second theorem, according to which no consistent and recursively enumerable theory T, which extends Peano arithmetic, proves consistency sentences which are based on probability predicates satisfying Lipp's conditions. And so the main task of today's talk is how can we infer the philosophical interpretation IG2 from its underlying metamathematical result G2. Now, this problem would not be very interesting if interpretations such as IG2 were mere abbreviations of technical results used, say, by logicians to abbreviate matters when they discuss the technical work. However, as you've seen already in this conference several times, claims such as IG2 play a crucial role in the philosophical literature as limitation results. For instance, in the context of Hilbert's program, in the context of the philosophy of mind, uh, deflationism, and so on. And the philosophical significance of IG2 has also been highlighted by Tetlipson, according to whom, I quote, even though IG2, the philosophical interpretation, does not itself constitute a philosophical application of G2, it is the type of statement upon which such an application must be based. So to illustrate, while IG2 does not itself state that G2 refutes Hilbert's program, it is nonetheless the type of statement to which such an evaluation of Hilbert's program must need appeal. It is, in a word, what for philosophical purposes we might regard G2 as saying. And this is precisely the reason why Auerbach emphasizes the importance of justifying the inference from a metamathematical result to its philosophical interpretation. And he says, quote, these loser remarks, or sometimes IG2, are the usual material for philosophical writings concerning the philosophical significance or consequences of the Gödel second theorem. Since IG2 isn't the mathematically proved second theorem, such writings would be helped by an argument that IG2 is true. And following that lesson in Auerbach, I take statements such as IG2 to belong to a technical fragment of natural language, one we use when we engage in metamathematical or philosophical practice. And according to this, let's consider again our claim IG2 here, I take the word consistency to have its usual precise metamathematical meaning. The phrase contains a certain amount of arithmetic, on the other hand, does not have a standard mathematical meaning. So it's clear by now already that when we want to infer IG2 from a precisely phrased metamathematical result, further premises are required. And these further premises are also called bridge principles, 
because they help us to translate informal or philosophical vocabulary to technical terminology. And for the standard inference, I've isolated the following three premises. According to P1, every theory that contains a certain amount of arithmetic is a recursively numerable theory which extends beyond arithmetic and where the language of the theory contains the usual arithmetical vocabulary. According to P2, a theory proves its own consistency if and only if there is a provable sentence which expresses the consistency of T. And according to P3, every sentence which expresses the consistency of a theory is of the form not provable falsum, where provable satisfies those conditions. And it's now very easy to see that together with these bridge principles, we can infer the interpretation IG2 from its underlying precise metamathematical theorem. And I argue this, that despite this inference being valid, it is inadequate. And the reason for that is that the premises P1 and P3 rely on specific but arbitrarily choices in the formalization process. And in order to make this point in more detail, let's zoom in on P1, which relies on a specific choice of a notation system for our arithmetical language, let's say infix notation on strings. And according to this choice, we can then formalize the sentence the claim that every number has a successor using this infix string here. But of course, this choice is highly arbitrary. So alternatively, we could employ Polish notation. We could use Piano's original notation, where we don't have a primitive symbol for universal quantification, but use auxiliary symbols. Yet another alternative is to, instead of using variables, we may want, we may want to achieve cross-reference by drawing curved lines between the quantify occurrences and the argument positions, as for instance proposed by Quine and Bourbaki. We may also base notations on parsing trees, which clearly exhibit the recursive structure of our formal expressions. Or we may use the Bruyne indices, excuse me, Albert, if I mispronounce this, and where we specify or where we like bind quantify occurrences with the argument positions by specifying the number of quantifiers in between their path. We may base notations on nested lists or so-called S expressions, such as done by Kleene and Pfefferman, or we may opt for an abstract algebraic approach and take expressions just to be elements of certain free algebras. And in fact, all of these notation systems and many more have been used and proposed in the literature. So now confronted with this abundance of different but equally adequate notation systems, we can read the claim IG2 in two different ways. According to the first formalization dependent reading, we identify at the outset theories with sets of certain infix strings. While the second reading of IG2, the formalization independent reading, permits the formalization of arithmetic, say, by all kinds of different notation systems. And I argue that in his refutation of Hilbert's program, Shapiro requires a robust, that is, formalization independent reading of IG2. And in order to see this, let's look at the following passage of Shapiro. So I quote, IG2 does indicate trouble for the Hilbert program. Let PA be a formalization of ideal arithmetic, say, the classical theory of the natural numbers. The Hilbert program requires a finitary proof of the consistency of PA. But the second incompleteness theorem is that if PA is in fact consistent, then a straightforward statement of the consistency of PA is not derivable in PA itself, let alone in the finitary portion of PA. The same goes for any other formal system, so long as it contains a certain amount of arithmetic. So if we would read IG2 in a formalization dependent way, then all we could show is that if we formalize arithmetic as a set of certain infix strings, then arithmetic cannot prove its consistency. But this does not exclude the possibility that a different formalization of arithmetic based on, say, Polish notation actually proves its consistency. So clearly, a successful rebuttal of Hilbert's program, as envisaged by Shapiro, requires a formalization independent, that is robust reading of IG2. And for this very reason, um, the premise P1, which was based on a specific choice of notation system, is inadequate. OK, let's look at the premise P3, which relies on a specific notation system and a specific numbering. And in order to make this explicit, 
I add a parameter Yota for the use notation system in the formulation of Lips conditions. And I add a parameter alpha for the used numbering. And then I say that a formula provable Yota alpha satisfies Lips conditions relative to Yota and relative to alpha if the usual three clauses hold. So now, according to P3, um, we have a specific, like, we, like P3 was uh, formulated regarding a specific choice of um, um, formalization, right? So let's use the ones um, of Gödel's seminal paper, for, for example. And then other standard consistencies uh, sentences found in the literature do no longer express consistency. So for, for one example is the consistency sentence, not provable falsum, the provable is the standard provability predicate of Befferman's arithmetization paper. So uh, according to P3, where the formalization choices are fixed, then this example will no longer express consistency, which is of course absurd. So confronted with these considerations, I argue that adequate inferences of philosophical interpretations such as IG2, at least on the reading or how they are apply applied in philosophical contexts, require formalization independent premises. And in particular, uh, I propose to replace the premises P1 and P3 by the following formalization independent premises. And basically all what we do is we existentially quantify over the notation system in P1. We treat the notation system as a variable which is passed through in P2 and we existentially quantify over the numbering in P3. So now we turn the premises P1 to P3 into adequate formalization independent versions. But now we will see that the resulting inference is no longer valid. And the reason for this is that our metamathematical theorem is insufficiently general because it is formulated and proved regarding specific formalization choices. And so in order to render this inference valid, um, the variance of Gödel's second theorem is called for. And by that, I mean the claim that for any chosen notation system and for any chosen numbering, we have that T does not prove um, consistency sentence based on a formula satisfying loops conditions relative to that chosen numbering and notation system. Okay, and before I will examine this uh, invariance claim in more detail, I would like to point out that very similar considerations just uh, presented will apply to other important philosophical interpretations of other metamathematical theorems. So for, for example, consider um, the following claim, the collection of all arithmetical truths is not arithmetically definable. This is usually inferred from the semantic version of Tarski's theorem, according to which the set of uh, true, say, infix strings is not definable in N, where N is an arithmetical model. And Definability in N is usually made precise just by means of a specific standard numbering. And similar considerations then show that an adequate inference of the philosophical interpretation from its underlying mathematical result requires the invariance of Tarski's theorem regarding numberings and notation systems. That is, we have to establish that the set of sentences which are true is not definable no matter what notation system we employ and no matter what numbering we use in order to make the definability in N precise. And prima facie, any, inject, uh, any injective function qualifies as a numbering at that stage, at this naive approach. Okay, so I will, um, I will in the rest of the talk, examine these invariance claims, and I will start by showing that these in naive versions are untenable. And the reason for that is that we can introduce, produce counterexamples. So, and um, I want to first show that we can produce counterexamples which result from the sort from, from Gödel numberings. So I fix a standard notation system, say infix notation, and then we can show that we can find a numbering alpha and a formula provable alpha which satisfies Loeb's conditions relative to alpha, such that provable gives rise to a provable consistency sentence in violation of Gödel's second theorem. We can also construct the numbering beta and a formula true beta such that true beta will define the set of all true strings relative to beta in violation to the semantic version of Tarski's theorem. 
And the cheapest way of doing that is just to assign even numbers to all the theorems and all the true sentences and odd numbers to all other expressions. And then the predicate is an even number will serve as our deviant probability predicate or truth predicate. However, we can also come up with less artificial deviant numberings. So for example, we can choose alpha and beta to be monotonic. We can construct the numbering alpha such that the set of um, alpha codes of theorems is decidable while a large class of syntactic construct operations are computable. And what do I mean by that? So here, for instance, let's look at the constructor symbol for a conjunction. And this is just a function which maps two expressions to the conjunction. And what I mean by this function being recursive relative to our numbering alpha is that the tracking function is recursive, or in other words, the function which maps two alpha codes of expressions to the alpha code to their conjunction. And similarly, we can construct a numbering beta such that the beta codes of two sentences is decidable. And again, a large number of slightly different constructor symbols is recursive relative to beta. And in particular, this shows that for these deviant numberings, we can give arithmetizations for the numeral function, for the substitution function for terms, and for atomic formally. But for reasons which will become apparent later, we cannot arithmeticize um, the substitution functions for also complex formally. I will get to that later. OK, so we have seen that there are deviant um, notation, uh, deviant uh, examples on the level of numberings, but we can independently also produce deviancy on the level of the notation systems. So we fix a uh, standard numbering gamma, and now we can construct a notation system iota such that, um, and we can find a formula provable iota which satisfies the conditions such that again this formula gives rise to a provable consistency sentence again in violation to the second theorem, and. Also here, the, the minimal example to produce such a deviant notation system is simply to color in all theorems red and color in all other expressions black, and then use the predicate is a red string as our deviant provability predicate. And that will satisfy those conditions and yield a provable consistency sentence. So at first sight, this all seems a bit odd because consider, for instance, um, Loeb's theorem, which we can derive based on loops conditions by purely modal reasoning. And this modal reasoning does not resort to the underlying Gödel numbering nor to the underlying notation system. And of course, in this proof, what we also need is the existence of fixed points. And using modus tollens, we can immediately see that the culprit, the reason for provable consistency sentence and the, the reason for the existence of definable truth predicate is the failure of the diagonal lemma for these deviant formalization choices. And what I mean by that is, in particular, we cannot find a fixed point, a provable fixed points for our deviant provability predicates, um, not provable alpha and not provable gamma. And we cannot find a semantic fixed point lambda such uh, for the predicate not true beta. And we can also see this quite immediately. I mean, let's say there was such a lambda, then we would have lambda if and only if not true lambda. And since true is a truth predicate, we also have that this is equivalent to not lambda, and we would therefore have lambda if and only if not lambda, which cannot be true in our interpretation n. Okay, so of course, I don't take these counterexamples to be genuine reputations of Gödel's and Tarski's theorems, because alpha, beta, and iota are inadmissible formalization choices. However, this shows us that our naive approach to invariance was um, ill-conceived, and we have to come up with a more refined approach. And in particular, we have to restrict our universal quantifiers in the invariance claims to admissible notation systems and admissible numberings. Now, of course, the question is, what, what is admissibility? And that will be the main topic of the rest of my talk. And in particular, I will analyze the admissibility of formalization choices relative to the given metamathematical context relative to the given theory and to the given interpretation. OK, um, so let me start with to show how we can abstract away from the choice of the numbering. And then in the fourth part, I will show how we can additionally also abstract away from the choice of the notation system. <clears throat> 
And in order to abstract away from the numbering, I will slightly generalize um, the notion of tracking computability, which features centrally in the field of computable algebra. And, and I do this as follows. So let rec denote the set of total recursive functions and let def n denote the set of numerical functions which are definable in n, where n is an arithmetical interpretation. And let C just be either the set of recursive functions or n definable functions in what follows. And we also say that the numerical relation is in C if its characteristic function is in C. Okay, that was just some terminology. And now we, like, let D be any omega algebra. And omega is here an algebraic signature. That is, it contains constant symbols and function symbols. And let alpha be any injective functions which maps elements of the algebra's domain to the natural numbers. And now we call alpha a C numbering of our algebra. If first of all, the image of D under alpha is in C, that is, its, uh, its char char characteristic function is in C. And second of all, if each fundamental operation on our algebra induces a tracking function which is in C. And by the tracking function of an operation on D, I just mean the function, the, the operation on codes, which makes that diagram commute. So the tracking function will simulate our operation on the set of codes. OK, to give you an example, um, let's consider the semigroup of uh, strings together with concatenation. And we just fix some alphabet here. And then the numbering of strings will be a rec numbering of the semi group, if and only if, first of all, the set of alpha codes of strings is decidable. And second of all, if the concatenation operation, which is the only fu fundamental operation on the semi group, will induce a recursive uh, tracking function, right? That is, we find a function here, there's a unique function on the set of alpha codes which makes that diagram commute. And we require that this tracking function is recursive. OK. And so according to my approach, admissible numberings are C numberings for suitable choices of C. And in order to make this view uh, plausible, we can start with considering our semigroup of strings and any given injective function alpha of strings. And now we see that the semigroup of alpha codes of strings together with the arithmetical concatenation operation arithmetically represents our semigroup of strings. And in particular, these will be isomorphic as semigroups. And now, in the context of Gödel's second theorem, what we really are concerned with is um, limitations for uh, giving limitations for a formal system T. And in particular, I would then require that admissible numberings ensure that we do not use resources which exceed C. So for example, when we define a numbering, we shouldn't have access to the information whether a string is a theorem of T, whether a string is true, and so on. And we can make this slightly more precise by requiring that T recognizes that it proves certain facts and properties about our representation of syntax. And now I've not said what facts and what properties, and of course there's a certain degree of freedom. And here I pursue a minimal approach, but just requiring that T recognizes that the two constituents of the given representation. That is, T knows whether or not a number codes a string, and whether or not given numbers are in the graph of the arithmetical concatenation operation. And that is, T enumerates the set of alpha codes of strings and the graph of the tracking function of the concatenation operation. And now since this T is uh, recursively enumerable, this is equivalent to alpha um, of strings, sorry, the set of alpha codes of strings being decidable and the arithmetical concatenation operation being recursive. And now, of course, you will immediately see by our previous definition that we just have reason for the requirement that every admissible numbering in the context of Gödel's second theorem is a recursive numbering of our semigroup of strings. And using very similar line of thought, we can extract the requirement in the context of um, Tarski's theorem and an interpretation n that every admissible numbering will be a definable n numbering. Okay, 
And now in order to start um, showing invariance results, we give a very useful uh, definition of reducibility of numberings. So let's alpha and b better be numberings of any set. And then we say alpha is C reducible to b if there is a function in our class C such that f basically translates alpha codes to beta codes. And we, we call alpha and beta C equivalent if they are mutually C reducible. Okay, and we can see reducibility is a pre-order and in particular C equivalence is an equivalence relation. And now we can show that for any two C numberings of a many sorted finitely generated algebra, these numberings will be C equivalent. And this is a slight generalization of a very important and fundamental result due to Maltsev. And so here really draw on rather old results in computable algebra. And from this very powerful theorem of Maltsev, we can basically immediately infer the invariance of Tarski's theorem regarding numberings. So we start with the following observation. Uh, let D be any finitely generated algebra. And then we know that the n definable subsets of this algebra will be invariant regarding C numberings, no matter what C is, while the decidable and recursive enumerable subsets of D are invariant regarding recursive numberings. And now we, again, let me remind you that we fix uh, our notation system. So we have infix notations on strings. And then we can show directly from uh, Maltsev theorem that the set of true strings is not definable in N relative to any definable N numbering of our semigroup of strings. And the proof is immediate. So we start with a standard numbering, which in particular will be a def N numbering. By the standard reasoning, we know that the set of gamma codes of true strings is not N definable. And since N definability is invariant, we can conclude that then out the set of alpha codes of true strings is also not N definable. Okay, so that was easy. And in order to prove the invariance of Gödel's second theorem, we have to first formalize certain properties of equivalent numberings or of translations into weak arithmetical theories. So we do this in virtue of the following technical lemma, let alpha and beta be numberings, which are with rec, um, rec equivalent, and let T be any theory extending um, the tarski mostowski robinson theory R. And then we find the binumeration F of the translation function, which translates um, alpha codes to beta codes, such that for every formula phi, we find a formula psi, so that T verifies that basically phi holds of um, the alpha code of an expression, if and only if psi holds of the beta code of that expression. Okay. And if moreover T is sigma two sound, then phi is sigma one numeration of as the set of alpha codes of B, where B is any set, then psi will numerate the beta codes of B in T. Okay, and from this lemma, we can now infer the invariance of uh, the diagonal lemma regarding numberings. And inspired by uh, Saleh, Saeed Salehi's talk, I will actually give now a new proof of the diagonal lemma, which I think is nice because it avoids the tedious process of arithmetization of the numeral function and of the substitution function. And instead of using these arithmetizations, um, I will employ self-referential numberings, which were first introduced by Kripke in a footnote of his famous Outline of the Theory of Truth paper and very recently explored in more detail, and which also has been discussed in very much detail by, uh, sorry, studied in very much detail by Albert Bisser. And I will first give a very simple construction of a self-referential numbering and then show how we can use this numbering to very quickly prove the diagonal lemma in an almost arithmetization-free way. So we start with some um, standard numbering gamma of set of strings and uh, effective enumeration psi n of all formally with x free. And now we define a new numbering delta, basically by mapping all expressions of the form psi k of numeral psi, uh, 2k plus 1, where k is minimal with regard to our enumeration. And we map these expressions to the number 2k plus 1. And we map all other expressions 
just to the number two times the standard code of that expression. And we can then see that, first of all, delta is a recursive numbering. And second of all, delta is self-referential. And that means that for any formula psi x, we find a number m such that the delta code of psi of numeral m equals m. So we really built in self-reference on the level of the numbering. And we can see that the second clause holds by um, let, let like psi be the nth element in our enumeration. And then we just take the number k such that um, psi k of 2k plus 1 is identical to the expression psi n of 2n plus 1. And then 2k plus 1 will already be the desired output because the delta code of that expression here is just 2k plus 1. OK, so that was a construction of um, a self-referential numbering. And let me now show how we can use this to prove the diagonal lemma. So we start out with any recursive numbering alpha and any formula phi with x3. And then by Maltzell theorem, we know that alpha and delta will be rec equivalent. So by the technical lemma above, we can then find a formula psi of x such that um, we can verify in R that phi will hold of the alpha code of an expression if and only if psi will hold of the delta code of that expression. So we formalize the, uh, the translation between these two codings. And now, because delta is self-referential, we find a number m such that the delta code of psi of m equals m. And in particular, then, the delta numeral of psi of m will be identical to the numeral of m. And using Leibniz's law, we can then infer that psi of the delta numeral of psi of m, if and only if psi of m, that's just because this expression here is just the same as that expression. Nothing happens here. And now we take a lambda, that is our fixed point, to be psi of m. And we can see that by this technical lemma here, we have that phi of the alpha code of lambda, if and only if the uh, psi of the delta code of lambda, right? That is our formalized translation function here. And then just putting these two bad conditionals together, we get that phi of the alpha code of lambda, if and only if psi of the delta code of lambda, but this is just that expression and that is equivalent to lambda itself. And therefore we have very quickly um, derived the diagonal lemma. And again, let me emphasize that no arithmetization of substitution or the numeral function was required. Not in that proof here, not in the construction of the self-referential numbering, and also not in the proof of the technical lemma here. Okay, um, so once we have established the invariance of the diagonal lemma regarding numberings, we can use the modal reasoning and just immediately conclude uh, the invariance of Gödel's second theorem regarding numberings. And that is, we can establish that for any consistent theory T, which extends um, R, we have that T does not prove a consistency sentence, which is based on um, a formula provable alpha satisfying groups conditions relative to any given recursive numbering. So here we have successfully abstracted away from the choice of the numbering. But now you might have observed already that um, in this theorem, we assume the existence of such provability predicates at the outset. So what could happen is that only the usually employed standard numberings permit the construction of provability predicates, satisfying groups conditions, and which are not trivial because we're not interested in x equals x. And if that was the case, then this inerrance claim, at least extensionally speaking, would be a trivial extension of the standard version of Gödel's second theorem. However, we can see that this is not the case. And we can actually show that for all recursive numberings alpha and sound recursive enumerable theories T extending R, we find a formula provable alpha which satisfies Lipp's conditions relative to alpha and numerates the alpha codes of theorems. And this numeration property here is just uh, the non-triviality clause. So again, otherwise um, the formula x equals x also satisfies Lipp's conditions and that would trivialize this question. 
Okay, so how to let me quickly sketch how to show this. Um, we start out with a standard numbering gamma and a standard provability predicate, provable asterisk. And now we come up with a new probability predicate, which says that if elementary arithmetic holds, then provable asterisk x. And by tweaking this um, provability predicate in that way, we ensure that provable, provable gamma satisfies um, Loeb's conditions relative to gamma and numerates um, the gamma codes of T, even for weak theories uh, such as R. And now, we can slightly generalize the technical lemma from before uh, and show that we can find the binomeration f of the translation function, which maps gamma codes to alpha codes. And we can come up with a formula provable alpha satisfying Lipps conditions relative to alpha, um, such again that we have in T provable gamma of the gamma code of an expression, even only provable alpha of the alpha code of an expression. And in particular, we can show that since provable gamma numerates the gamma codes of theorems, provable alpha will numerate the alpha code codes of theorems. And so in that sense, um, because we can find for each uh, recursive numbering such probability predicates, the invariant claim of uh, Gödel's second theorem is a proper extension of the standard version of Gödel's second theorem, which is formulated with regard to specific choice of numbering. OK, let me now um, come to the last part of my talk. So far, we have seen how to abstract away from the choice of the numbering while keeping the notation system standard and fixed. And now I would like to also, um, in addition to the numbering, abstract away from the notation system. And in order to do that, I will first of all introduce a unified algebraic framework for notation systems, which is sufficiently general to accommodate a large class of notation systems found in the literature, in particular, all the ones I've mentioned in the first part of my talk. Then I will say what I mean by the admissibility of a notation system. And finally, I will introduce um, invariant versions of Gödel and Tarski's theorems regarding numberings and notation systems. OK, so let's start. By a notation system for an arithmetical language L, I mean an ordered pair, where the first component is a many-sorted, finitely generated algebra. And you can think of this as a domain or ontology of expressions together with means of their manipulation. And the second component will be an implementation of so-called proto-expressions of our language into the algebra's domain. And one example is take again our semi-group of strings as our domain. And Yota can then be seen to correspond to infix notation on strings or Polish notation on strings and so on. Okay, but let me say more what I mean by proto expressions. And in order to do that, I will define for every language L a three sorted signature sigma L, which consists of the following constructor symbols. So sorry for this uh, packed slide, but nothing actually happens here. So we just we just, for all the elements of our language, we add a constructor symbol to sigma L. So we start, we start with adding a constant symbol and a unary function symbol, which helps us to generate infinitely many variables. So these two will be of type variable. Then we have a, um, a sort, sort of transfer function here, E, which embeds variables into terms. And for each function symbol of our arithmetical language, we add a function symbol also to our uh, constructor signature of the corresponding type. We have also a function symbol for identity, which, uh, which maps two terms to a formula. And we add constructor symbols for propositional connectives, for relation symbols, and for quantifiers. OK. And now we take uh, a proto-expression, or in short, a p-expression, just to be an element of the Herbrand universe of this um, constructor signature. And in particular, I call the terms of type variable also like a p variable or like a proto variable, the terms of type term, a p term, and terms of type formula, a p formula. And let now Yota be a family of functions such that we map p variables, p terms, and p formulae into our um, algebra. And now we define an equivalence relation uh, on our Herbrand universe 
by mapping any two, uh, sorry, by, by identifying any two p expressions which are implemented as the same object into our algebra. So to give you an example, recall that according to quine buber key notation, every p formula of the form for all x, there is a y such that x is the successor of y, where x and y are any variables. So for all such p formulae, they are implemented as the same object into our domain of expressions, namely by instead of using variables, by using these uh, curved lines here. So your equivalence for quine buber key notation will then coincide with alpha equivalence, that is syntactic identity up to renaming of bounded variables. Okay. And now we have the ingredients together to be able to define what we mean by an implementation. So again, let U to be our family of functions and let U be any L theory. And now we call U to an implementation of the proto expressions of our language alpha over the theory U into our algebra D. If first of all, um, your equivalence is a congruence relation on the term algebra. And this will ensure that the construct operations are well defined on the set of Yota notations. So, for example, it will be well defined to say that uh, Yota notation is a conjunction of two other Yota notations. We require also that for any two um, Yota equivalent p expressions, that they have the same amount of free variables. And in doing so, we ensure that um, it's well defined to speak about Yota sentences. Thirdly, we require that. Your equivalent p formulae, um, which are like p sentences, in fact, are provably equivalent in U. And in this way, we ensure that it's that uh, probability in U is well defined for your sentences. And finally, we require that if we replace your equivalent terms in your equivalent formally, the result will be your equivalent again. So substitution is well defined for your expressions. And here, just some more piece of terminology. So we call Yota of phi the Yota implementation of the p expression phi, which we also denote by using the subscript. And we call Yota phi a Yota variable, a Yota term, and the Yota formula, depending on whether phi is a p variable, p term, or p formula. Okay. Um, so this concludes the precise definition of a notation system. And now we can actually see that we can still produce deviant results both on the level of the first component of a notation system, that is the level of the, the domain of expressions. And we can also construct deviant results on the level of the implementation. So in order to get exclude such deviant notation systems, we now define a notion of admissibility. So we say that the notation system is CU adequate. And again, let me remind you that C here is either the set of recursive functions or definable functions in some arithmetical interpretation. So we call this CU adequate if, first of all, there is a C numbering of our algebra. Second of all, we require that um, there is uh, that Yota is an implementation over U, that is, U probability is well defined for Yota sentences. We require that Yota equivalence is in C together with a set of Yota variables, Yota terms, and Yota formally. And finally, um, we require that the function alpha composed tilde Yota is a C numbering of the quotient algebra modulo Yota equivalence. So let me show you what I mean by that. We, we know that Yota will induce a unique function Yota tilde where pi is the natural projection. So we just map a term to its equivalence class. And then yota tilde will just map uh, the equivalence class of a term to the value of this term under yota. And now we require that the function um, where we map first equivalence classes to our domain D and then via alpha to the naturals will be a C numbering of that quotient algebra here. Okay. And so, with this precise um, notion of um, adequacy, we can now turn again back to, to the question of whether the diagonal lemma is invariant regarding such notation systems. And just a final piece of terminology. So 
for a set T of P expressions, we set T yota simply to be the set of the yota implementations of that expressions. And now we define what it means for a yota expression to be derivable from a yota theory. So we just say that uh, phi yota is derivable in T yota if phi is derivable from T. And the same for uh, satisfiability. So basically we give um, the def definition of derivability like uh, this is totally parasitic on the definition of derivability and satisfiability for P expressions. And of course, this is only well defined if you is an implementation over T or over the theory of N, dependingly of what we speak here about. Okay, let's now look at the standards diagonal lemma, according to which we can find for any infix formula phi x, a fixed point lambda, right? Where we fix some standard numbering gamma. Oh, sorry. And now let uh, D yota be any given notation system for L, where yota is an implementation over T. And then by the stipulation above, we can find that in T yota, we can derive phi yota of the gamma numeral of lambda, even only if lambda yota. However, it's important to note that this is not the desired diagonal lemma for our notation system D yota. And the reason for that is that we use the fixed point alpha in yota notation, but we mention it in infix notation. And of course, what we want is a version of the diagonal lemma where the fixed point here and here is of course uh, in, in the same, given in the same notation system. And in order to do that, we basically just generalize the route I've sketched before. So what we do is we first define self-referential numberings. So we start with the implementation yota of um, p expressions such that yota equivalence is in C and also so is the set of yota variables, yota terms, and yota formally. And now we can construct a self-referential C numbering of the quotient algebra modulo yota equivalence. That is, for every equivalence class phi with exactly one free variable, we find a number m such that the delta code of phi of m equals m. And then using the technical lemma I have um, outlined before, we can immediately infer both the syntactic and semantic version of the diagonal lemma. So in the case of the syntactic diagonal lemma, we can show that for any theory extending um, R and for any rec T adequate notation system and for any recursive numbering alpha, we find for any given yota formula phi, a yota sentence lambda, which will serve as our fixed point. That is, we have phi of yota of the alpha numeral of lambda yota, if and only of lambda yota. And similarly for the semantic diagonal lemma. So here we, instead of like here, we can be more liberal. So we can, we can, we only need that the notation system is definable and theory and adequate, and that our numbering is defi uh, definable and numbering of our algebra. And then we can, for any formula phi yota, we find a fixed point such that this biconditional is true in N. So that's an invariance of the semantic diagonal lemma. And now, using these two versions of the diagonal lemma, we can immediately infer the desired invariance claims. So we can show that for any consistent theory T extending R, we have that T does not prove any consistency sentence, which is based on a formula provable satisfying loops conditions relative to any given um, rec T adequate notation system and any given recursive numbering alpha. And so this is now the desired version of the invariance claim in its full generality. And we can finally adequately infer the philosophical interpretation IG2 from this invariance claim together with the formalization independent bridge principles. And in the context of Gödel's second theorem, we have used that every admissible notation system is rect adequate and that every admissible Gödel numbering is a rec numbering. And I've only given you a kind of um, argument for the second claim, but we can use similar con considerations to also extract the first requirement. 
And similarly, um, okay, like this is just, I just have uh, listed here the inference in, in more detail. So similarly, we can um, derive from the semantic version of the diagonal lemma the invariance of Tarski's theorem. So here we can show that the set of true sentences is not definable in n, no matter what definable n numbering we choose, and no matter what definable n theory and adequate notation system we use. So also here we have finally reached our desired invariance claim. And we can use this to adequately infer the philosophical interpretation of Tarski's theorem from this invariance claim and the following formalization independent premise, according to which the collection of arithmetical truths is arithmetically definable if we can find a language which contains the usual arithmetical vocabulary with interpretation n, an admissible notation system, um, an admissible numbering such that the resulting set of two sentences is definable in N. Okay, and here we use um, that every admissible notation system is definable N theory and adequate, and that every admissible numbering is a definable N numbering. Okay, so to sum up, um, I started with the question how we can justify the inference from prevalent philosophical interpretations from the underlying metamathematical results. And I've tried to argue that these inferences require robust, that is, formalization independent versions of Gödel and Tarski's theorems. I've then showed that there are deviant formalization choices which yield count examples to these theorems, which, however, are philosophically innocent since they employ inadmissible formalization choices. And so instead, we need to focus and we need to restrict our invariance claims to admissible formalization choices. And here, admissibility was analyzed in a highly context-sensitive manner. And then finally, I've shown how we can establish the invariance of Gödel and Tarski's theorems regarding admissible notation systems and admissible numberings, and therefore provide a proper base for these prevalent philosophical interpretations. Okay, thank you very much.